Welcome to the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute and our program, Remarkable Reptiles. My name is Caden, and here I am with one of our turtles that we have here in the building that I am. And I'm going to tell you where I am in just a second. So here's Smithsonian's National Zoo. So this is where I am today. This is where I work, and this would be the front of the zoo. If you've ever been here before, you would have walked right past this. And the red dot is where I am on the map in Washington, DC is where we are located. If you look at the rest of the map, see if you can figure out where you are located. And I know the United States is a little hard to see, so I'll zoom in in a second. All right, there's the states a little bit closer if that helps some of you. Okay, now the zoo, our zoo is a long zoo on a big hill and where we are today is in the Reptile Discovery Center. So I circled that in red. So we're towards the bottom of the hill. This is what the building looks like. And this is a picture of one of our keepers at the Reptile Discovery Center, Kyle. And he's overlooking our Cuban crocodiles. All right, you know I love jokes if you have joined me before. So let's start out with a joke before we dive into our program. What do lizards eat with their hamburgers? Pop it in the chat or turn and tell your neighbor. I'm gonna open the chat so I can see. Oh, I've got lots of good guesses so far. Oh, pickles. My team loves pickles. So that would be a good answer. Not the one I was looking for. Okay, a lot of you got it. Are you ready? Okay, it is French flies. Mmm, delicious. All right, good guesses, everybody. All right, for those of you that don't know our whole package, we do have two videos that came along with this program. I wonder about reptiles. Uh, that's a great one to watch before the program, but it's a wonderful one standalone or afterwards as well. And a career connections video where you can see our guest speaker today a little bit closer and see some of the things he does for his job. We also have a worksheet you can do before, during, or after the program called I Am a Reptile, and then our conservation comic. Conservation comic is a great one to do afterwards, um, and if you want to share it, we would love to see it. Here are some of our ones from our last program. We always have different activities. I know we have one from Alex, Natalie, and Liam from last month, our duck stamps. And then we have a few from our previous program. So great job. Thank you for sending those in. The email's there if you want to send your conservation comic in, or it's also on our website when you download it. All right, joining our team today, we have Erica. Erica will be helping out by tossing all of the questions that she gathers from you over to us so we can answer them. Hello, Erica. Hi, Kaden. Thank you for joining us today. We also have our guest speaker, Kyle. I'll have him wave to you and say hi. Hello. He's right next to me. So we'll learn more about him and what he does as he shows us some of our animals for the day. We have two guest Q&A answers as well. So these are experts. Sarah and Matt work in the Reptile Discovery Center. So they will be answering some of your questions that you have. Also behind the scenes, we have lots of staff and volunteers answering questions. So thank you all for your help there. All right, let's use the chat again. And some of you already put this in, but I want to know where you're slithering in from. So let me open the chat. I see Kentucky, Texas, Maryland, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Florida, Washington, DC, Massachusetts, Minnesota, California, New Jersey, Paris, oh, China, Virginia. There are so many that I can't even keep up. Canada, love it. I'm gonna keep watching as you do that. Ohio, Puerto Rico, awesome. Thank you all for joining from all over. We are so excited to have you here. We love it. I'm gonna read through those in a little bit so I can see all of them. All right, but are we ready to get started? I think so. 
All right, welcome to Remarkable Reptiles at Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. I'm Caden, if you missed the intro, so welcome to the program and let's get started. Before we get going too far, we need to know, what is a reptile? If you can use your emoji reactions, feel free to use a heart for the pictures I show that are re or not reptiles, hearts for not reptiles, and a thumbs up if they are reptiles. If you don't have access to emojis, you can turn and tell your neighbor, you can pop it in the chat um, or just think it to yourself. Here we go. Am I a reptile? How about a snail? Heart for not a reptile, thumbs up for reptile. All right. I'm gonna keep going. We'll go over them in a second. I see your reactions. A cheetah. Heart for not a reptile, thumbs up for reptile. How about a pelican? Good, I'm getting lots of not reptiles. Good for all three of these, perfect. How about a rhinoceros snake? Good. Aldabra tortoise? All right, both of those are reptiles. I see lots of thumbs up. A caiman lizard. Lots of thumbs up, good, it is a reptile. How about a northern red salamander? Or our last one, a silver arowana. Mm. Not reptiles. Salamander can look a little bit like a reptile, but is an amphibian. Good, so we have three reptiles here on this page. And I bet when you're thinking, I know what a reptile is, and you're looking at these pictures, you're probably thinking about some of their traits. So traits are things that this group of animal have in common, like birds have feathers. So let's look at some of the traits of reptiles. You can pop them in the chat. I'll open the chat so I can see them. What kind of traits do you think of when you think of reptiles? What do they have? How can you tell it's a reptile? Give you a second. You can also turn and tell your neighbor. Awesome. I'm seeing every single one of these answers. Perfect. I'll go over them. All right. Scales. So if they have scales like this snake right here, it would be a reptile. If they have vertebrae, vertebrae are the bones, just like you have up and down your back. You can feel them if you feel the center of your back. That's vertebrae, they have those as well. Reptiles also breathe air, so they have lungs. They lay eggs, but not every single reptile lays eggs exactly, but they do lay eggs. That's just a tricky one to go into. And they are ectothermic, also known as cold-blooded, you may have learned, but ectothermic is a better word to use because they don't really have cold blood. Ectothermic means if, they need to get warm, they may need to go find some sunshine to lay in. So they don't regulate their temperature as well as we mammals do. Okay, so reptile habitats. Let me show you some pictures of habitats and then I wanna hear from you which ones they live in. We've got prairie and pond, Arctic, ocean, desert, mountain and stream, and then forest, and I think I wrote wetland, I just can't see it. I'm gonna open the chat again. You can also turn and tell your neighbor, which ones don't they live in? Are there one or two you think they might not live in? Good, I see lots of great answers. We often think ocean maybe because why would reptiles live in the ocean? But what about sea turtles, right? They're reptiles. There's some lizards that live along the ocean as well. I think that snowy one, you're all getting it, the Arctic. Remember I said they're ectothermic. They can't regulate their temperature very well. So they need to be someplace it's warm at least some of the time. So the Arctic is always cold and snowy. So we will not find them there, but they live in every other habitat really that we have. They love deserts. They like where it's warm and dry. They like some wet areas as well. Just depends on the reptile. All right, thumbs up if you are ready to meet our first reptile. 
Oh, I was going to ask you a question first. So I see lots of thumbs up. What do reptiles do when they live places where it's snowy though? What do they do in the winter? Good, Joanna got it right away. Oh, I'm seeing everyone now. They hibernate. They rest or sleep oftentimes underground in the winter because it's not warm enough for them. It's kind of like the Arctic to them when winter's here. Good. Okay. Who am I? Let's have your guesses in the chat. What kind of reptile? I have a tail. I have so many ribs and vertebrae. I am longer than some lizards and I don't have any legs. This is a, the best clue. Good. Good job, everybody. You got it. A snake. It could have also been a legless lizard. That is a thing too. Great job. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing so we can put all of our attention on Kyle and our friend, the snake. All right. So I'm just going to move this over. Take it away, Kyle. Tell us about Maisie, this is Maisie, and what kind of snake is she? Maisie, so Maisie is a corn snake, and uh, these guys are from the United States, so they're one of our very common U.S. natives, and Maisie is cruising today. I mean, she's excited is. to have some attention today. See all you guys. Um, so again, Maisie's a corn snake. Um, they get that name uh, for a couple of reasons. There are two things that, uh, that I've heard pretty commonly passed around about why they're called a corn snake. Uh, number one, is they're often found near uh, near um, buildings where like or areas where grain is produced, and uh, so you're gonna have a lot of corn, which will also attract a lot of mice, and uh, that's their that's their main uh, the main bulk of their diet is mice, so rodents, um, and they also have that common name corn snake because of their uh, pattern. If you look at that, they have that very uh, bold orange pattern, contrasting with that nice cream belly, and that looks like a lot of varieties of corn. Uh, these are by far one of my favorite snakes. This is actually the first snake I met. Um, I believe I was in kindergarten. Uh, so that was years and years ago. But <laughs> but uh, these were one of the first snakes I met. I was so captivated by it. That was part of where I uh, fell in love with reptiles when I got to meet a corn snake, just like this one when I was in kindergarten. Um, so Maisie here is still pretty young. Uh, she's about five years old. So she's still got some growing to do. Um, she'll be about four to six feet when she's full grown. So she's about about three feet now, three and a half feet. So she's got some size to put on. Um, we feed her rodents every couple of weeks. So mice are her favorite food. So she eats mice just like these guys do in the wild. Um, again, a very gentle snake, uh, um, very popular classroom pet um, for anyone that's interested in, you know, learning how to uh, take care of reptiles and, you know, looking for a good first reptile pet. I always recommend the corn snakes. They're very commonly produce. These animals aren't taken out the wild. And um, again, they also have least concern in the wild. So you know you're not impacting their uh, wild populations um, through the pet trade. That's a question I was yeah. going to ask you in a bit, Kyle, is if we wanted one as a pet, what are some of the steps we could do? Do we need to research it? How do we need to know how to take care of it? Um, so the biggest thing I say is, um, for one, always make sure your animals are what's called captive bred. And uh, the, the uh, any of the uh, individuals that produce them, they're should be very honest about that. So you never want to get any animal that's wild caught. And um, yeah, just always do your research. So um, there's plenty of information out there on the zoo's website. There's a lot of information out there on corn snake habitat and their diet, what they eat. Um, yeah, as I said, they're very common pet snake. There are lots of books out there on corn snakes, uh, but just even a quick Google search, corn snake care will tell you a lot that you need to know. Um, so yeah, so they're definitely one I recommend. As you see, she's very gentle. Uh, she's kind of climbing me like a tree branch. So that gets me to other uh, habitat. So these guys are found, um, as I said, they're found in farms and open, uh, open overgrown fields, forests, uh, so pretty variable habitat. Um, I believe the northern po most part of their range would be like New Jersey, but they're found all the way down through Florida. And their color, size, and pattern will vary slightly based on where in the U.S. you find them. But, um, but yeah, all very, you know, gentle, very beautiful snakes. And uh, what are some yeah. adaptations you have for living in those habitats? Um, so one thing that uh, people typically don't think of when they think of a corn snake is, um, well, hey, this this pattern helps them camouflage, but uh, something in terms of their um, their feeding behavior. So when you think of constrictor, you normally think of pythons, boas, 
Uh, but believe it or not, corn snakes are actually constrictors. So they um, take down their prey with the same methods that a python or boa would. But that's usually not um, associated with uh, talk about corn snakes. Like everyone thinks of the big pythons and boas when you think of constrictors. But these little guys are constrictors too. Yeah, so that means they're not venomous. No, okay. no, so they're not venomous. Um, that's great. Yep. And we call this program Remarkable Reptiles. What's something about snakes that makes them remarkable? So regarding corn snakes specifically, uh, this applies to a lot of other snakes. These guys actually help with uh, the spread of disease due to the impact they have on rodent populations. Uh, rodents are notorious for spreading disease that impacts humans and corn snakes keeping those rodent populations in check actually helps prevent the uh, spread of diseases that would be carried through rodents. That's awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Yep. Erica, do we have some questions? I'm sure we have a ton coming in. I see lots of comments in the chat that people are loving Maisie. Of course we do. Yes, lots of comments, lots of wow and so cool. So I'm glad people are already loving reptiles out there. You talked about this snake not being venomous, but we do have a bunch of questions about um, her mouth. Uh, will she bite and does she have teeth? So yes, they do have teeth. All snakes have teeth. And I answer that question this way with uh, regarding any animal. Um, anything with a mouth and teeth can bite, but um, she's not threatened. Uh, she's not out to hurt anybody. That's even with wild snakes. They're not just going to bite you for no reason. Uh, if you do encounter a snake in the wild, you know, stay out of its way and it'll stay out of your way. But um, yes, yeah, she does have a mouth and teeth and she can bite, but you know, she's not threatened. Uh, she's very used to being handled. And again, even if she had never been touched before, she has no reason to just bite someone for no reason, um, just because snakes don't, they don't do that. Awesome. And there's a question from Anna, how you hold a snake. And we see you holding Maisie, but can you explain a little bit um, how she's kind of gripping on and moving around while you hold her? Uh, yeah, so these guys are actually good climbers. Uh, so one thing I'll do um, with a lot of our snakes that we'll use for programs is I kind of like to think of myself as a tree. My arms are the branches. And so she's just kind of cruising, getting comfortable on the branches. Uh, you never want to apply too much restraint. So you don't want to squeeze the snake. You just want to very gently, you know, kind of keep your hands open and let them go where they want to go. Uh, as long as they're relaxed, they tend to be very slow moving. Um, and, you know, if I felt she was getting too stressed or wanted to uh, go back into uh, her hide and her enclosure, then, um, you know, I'd never force her to be on camera. I would then put her away at that point. So, so yeah, you just kind of just very gently keep your hands open. Think of yourself as a tree and your arms are the branches. And she's just kind of hanging out in her tree is what she's doing right now. Awesome, a good temporary hab habitat for her right now. So we see a lot of bright colors on this corn snake, but uh, we have someone wondering, can um, corn snakes see colors? No, so as far as research has shown, um, we do not believe these guys can see color. Um, now what's interesting is there's always a lot of, uh, not to get into too much of the nitpicky detail about um, reptile, eye biology but uh, there's always new studies coming up that try to uh assess like color and um how well certain reptiles can see color from crocodiles to snakes to monitors so um yeah but as far as we do know now and you know snakes do not see color that's fascinating and a question we heard that they are ectothermic but uh, or cold-blooded, um, are there any snakes that can live in cold places all year round, though? This is what Rosie Rose wants to know. Um, so not all year round, but uh, so this would apply to the corn snake. Uh, as far as the snakes we have in our collection, the indigo snakes, pine snakes, um, timber rattlesnakes. Uh, so there are snakes that, uh, that during part of the year when it gets cold, so this corn snake was in the wild, they'll do what's called a uh, brumation. Um, you're probably, most of you are probably more familiar with the term hibernation, but that's uh, pretty much well, they'll shut down for the winter and uh, they'll go somewhere that's nice and secure. Um, they're not eating, they're not active, they're just kind of hunkered down and they come back out when the uh, temperatures start rising. So um, during this time of year in the wild, uh, corn snakes would be brumating and hiding out in this part of the, this part of the country at least. Great. Well, I'm sure we could ask questions all day long, but I think we might be ready to see another visitor. Yeah. And I do have one question that was on here that I always like to talk about is how can they search big animals? Well, snakes can actually unhinge their jaw. So everyone feel up by your ear and open and close your mouth. You feel your bones moving? 
All right, now open your mouth as wide as you can. It eventually stops, right? Well, snakes can take those bones apart and have a stretchy muscle that will make their jaw get really wide. So instead of just opening it like that, they can go. And that's how they can get something so big in their mouth. So pretty crazy. Okay, so here's an up close view of Maisie. That's who we were seeing. Now, I have a question for you. I'm going to launch this poll. Now, are all snakes venomous? wanting to bite you this is a true or false question so in the poll true would mean yes all snakes are venomous and they all want to bite you false would mean no they're not all venomous and they don't all want to bite you I'll give you a few seconds to pop in your poll or turn and tell your neighbor okay you're all getting it Good, you're all going with false and you are correct. So not all snakes are venomous. Maisie the corn snake was not venomous. So venom would mean when the snake bites you and they inject something in you that could make you sick and they don't all wanna bite you. They're only really gonna wanna bite you if you are bothering them. If you're leaving them alone, they don't care. They'll be fine to leave you alone as well. Good job, everybody. Okay, well, in that poll. All right, let's guess our next animal. Oh, I forgot. We can do our worksheet first. All right. So if you have your I am a reptile, I'm going to show you one thing to do. And then you can fill out the rest on your own when we're doing the program. But this worksheet, we just talked about a snake. A snake is a reptile. You can circle that snake just like that. And as we're going in the program, you can circle the other reptiles we talk about, but we may not talk about all of them too. So you may have to uh, do some research or figure out which reptiles are which. Okay, who am I? I am a reptile. Well, that, we know that, right? I have a long body. I have four legs and a tail. So not a snake this time. Sometimes my tongue is long and sticky with some of these. Pop in the chat. What do you think it is? But I see maybe a lizard, a chameleon, Komodo dragon. So many great guesses. I do see some frogs and toads. Those are amphibians, though, not reptiles. Good. We are going to look at a lizard. This lizard right here is named Douglas. So are we ready to meet Douglas? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. Good. I see thumbs up. I'm going to stop sharing and let's go over to Kyle to look at Douglas. All right, everyone. So again, here's Douglas and Douglas is a shingleback skink. Now I'm going to tell you why they got that name or that common name at least. Uh, they call them shingleback skinks. If you look really closely at their back, the scales look like shingles on a roof. So if you look up at a roof and look at the scales on the backs of these guys, very similar. Uh, so that's how they get the common name shingleback skink, um, also known as the pine cone sneak, skink for uh, similar, similar reasons, like self-explanatory. These guys look like a big pine cone, especially if you look at just the tail there. Yeah, if you were to see that by itself, uh, just Definitely. sitting in the grass, that looks like a, looks like a pine cone. Uh, so these are one of my favorite lizards. Uh, I've always been a big fan of the shinglebacks ever since I found out about them on TV, you know, back as a kid, and I was always like, oh man, I'd love to see one of those. So it's been really exciting to uh, get to work with these hands-on here at the zoo. Um, shinglebacks are found, you know, they're pretty widespread throughout Australia. Um, they're not of any particular conservation concern, which is great. Um, so again, you're very widespread. Uh, they do tend to, um, tend to, uh, they're omni uh, omnivores, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so they love salad. Uh, that's their, uh, the bulk of their diet here is, uh, is greens and other vegetables. And occasionally we'll throw in some meaty items for them. Um, if you look at their, uh, you look at their jaws here, that head, very, very strong jaws, that very bulldoggy kind of head for a reptile. Uh, that's due to, um, in the wild, these guys are often found eating snails. So they, uh, they will crush the snails and that's what those strong jaws are for, for crushing snail shells. So yeah, so very neat. You can see that tongue click in there. So if you try to look closely, you might be able to see the color if I can get it in focus there. Um, they have almost like a blue tongue. So uh, here we have one of their, uh, I guess you could call it their cousin, uh, the blue tongue skink. 
which is in the same genus, so very similar species. Uh, these guys and blue tongue skinks, they'll use that as part of their uh, threat display. So they're encountered by a predator and um, you know, skinks aren't necessarily the fastest moving animals, so they don't run away super fast like uh, it's a common animal you can think of running, like the bearded dragon that you may have seen before or green iguanas, which you know, longer legs can zip up the trees or zip across the desert really fast. Uh, these guys have their short little legs and so they're not really gonna be too good at running away from a predator. But uh, they have two parts to their, um, to their uh, adaptation that helps them hopefully survive an encounter with a predator. Uh, for one, they'll open that mouth and huff and puff and make themselves look bigger. And they'll uh, kind of gyrate that tongue in the wild, uh, those bright colors. So seeing a tongue that bright color uh, is often a sign that something may be poisonous. And what they'll also do is kind of wave that tail around. And if you look at these guys, the tail and the head look very similar. So what they'll do is they'll kind of try to draw the predator's attention to that tail. And they can't actually drop their tail like a gecko or iguana can, but if a predator grabs that tail and they start pulling, oh, all right, well, Douglas is known for this. Just have a little <laughs> bathroom break. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's make sure he gets that all out. That happens with live animals sometimes, yep. yeah. Come on, Douglas, everybody's watching. Oh, oh okay. there it goes. It splashed on me, everyone. This is what we do for you. So Douglas is not potty trained. Um, I am working on it. So hopefully we'll get him. No, I'm just kidding. I'll see. <laughs> yeah, he, he's very, uh, he's very well known for that. So um, skinks are very, uh, they're very good at not holding their, uh, their bathroom situation, <laughs> especially when they're on live camera. Anyway, so um, what was I talking about? Oh, their adaptation. So um, if a predator grabs the tail, instead of the head, they stand a much better chance of survival, even though, again, they can't drop it like a gecko can. If they pull away and the predator just breaks off a piece of that tail, like say it's a, a dingo or feral cat, um, they're likely to survive that versus the head getting bitten. So that's another one of their uh, very cool adaptations. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's kind of the, the basics of Douglas the Shingleback. We are talking about the habitat. Oh yeah, so uh, these guys, again, very widespread throughout Australia. They like it very hot and dry. Um, so they're found in a very arid habitat. Uh, these guys are often found in um, const on construction sites, like under sheet metal. Um, people find them in their yards, like again, very, very common and highly adaptable. So uh, everywhere from just, you know, hot, arid desert to um, someone's backyard in Australia, so. Uh, what makes Douglas or other lizards remarkable? So one cool thing that makes Douglas remarkable that uh, actually sets them apart from other lizards is uh, shingleback skinks will actually pair bond. Um, mm -hmm. So they're monogamous. So you actually don't see that a lot with um, reptiles or amphibians at all, really with a lot of animals. Um, so once these guys find their mate, uh, they tend to stick together for life. So uh, I had no idea. That's really cool. So yeah, Douglas is very romantic. <laughs> Good thing for Valentine's Day coming yeah. up. Yeah. All right, Erica, what questions do we have from our students? Oh, I love this. A lot of questions about uh, Douglas's tongue, of course. You already explained uh, that it's uh, the color and why, but can you explain why he's sticking out his tongue and how he could possibly catch food with such a small tongue? So Douglas wouldn't use his tongue to catch food, but the uh, reptiles will use their tongue as a uh, part of their, what we call their uh, chemosensory ability. So that's using, um, instead of a nose like we have, their tongue can kind of function as a supplement to their nares. So um, so you see he has these little nares right here, which would be similar to my nostrils here, but uh, he's also smelling with that tongue. So he's picking up all kinds of scent particles in the air. Uh, he's picking up scents on me. Um, he can smell Caden over here. He can smell the table. He smells his poop that he just uh, <laughs> that he just um, dropped on me there. So, um, so yeah, so they'll use that to, uh, to sniff out food and unlike snakes these guys do have a lot better vision so um douglas can see a snail you know crawling across the uh crawling across something there in front of them and grab it um they can see the vegetation that they're attracted to so they're walking across a nice leafy bush that they want to take a bite of um you know again their tongue will help them sniff everything out on there but they can also see and like know exactly what they're taking a big bite of Awesome. And speaking of the poo, of course, we have a question about it. Uh, why is his poo white? Is that from diet? Uh, yeah, so those are actually urates. So you'll see that with snakes and lizards. 
um, their pee doesn't come out in the same way that uh, that ours does or like mammals does. It um, it condenses to like a chalky white substance and comes out that way. And there is some liquid involved, as you saw some of the liquid coming out with Douglas there, but uh, the actual um, urinary matter is that white chalky substance. So you see that with snakes and lizards. Great. And uh, looking at his body, I might guess the answer to this, but can Douglas swim? No, Douglas would be a terrible swimmer. Um, with those short little legs, he might try, but he's not gonna get very far. And now there are lizards that are great swimmers, like uh, you know, iguanas are great swimmers. The uh, monitor lizards are great swimmers. Um, but uh, yeah, Douglas is not gonna be the best at swimming. Um, yeah, so as I said, these guys are from a very arid habitat. Uh, they're not encountering water too much. And to be honest, they really primarily get their water from the greens that they eat. So they're not out even searching for puddles of water to, uh, to stay hydrated. They're just, they're getting their water from the, uh, the vegetation that they eat. So um, yeah, Douglas doesn't want anything to do with a lot of water, especially deep water. Okay, and I think last question for uh, you and Douglas here. Um, well, you talked about pets with the corn snake, Maisie. Can people have these lizards or other lizards as pets? Oh, definitely. So the shingleback skinks are gonna be hard to find in the United States. Um, but as, they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, their cousin, the blue tongue skink is a great pet lizard. Uh, very hardy, um, tend to be very friendly. Um, other great beginner lizards would be like the leopard gecko, um, which we have here, which you could come see when you're on site at the zoo. Uh, we use them for demos a lot, great lizard for kids. That was one of my first pet lizards was a leopard gecko. Um, so yeah, leopard geckos, blue tongue skinks, uh, those would be great pets that, uh, especially with the blue tongue, it's gonna be very similar to Douglas here. Uh, you're just gonna have uh, a little bit of a different, um, Similar shape, just scales are going to be a lot different. Oh, oh, come Why? It's all Why? those leaves he was eating. Yeah, he's Doug, Douglas can be very. Someone very, wanted to know: Does Douglas have teeth, or do lizards in general have teeth? Yes. Yeah, so again, like they uh, teeth, very strong jaws. Like I said, Douglas is cracking uh cracking snail shells there. Yeah. So yes, they are very small. Um, so not as distinct as you would see on like a Komodo dragon, for example. But um, even the purely herbivorous lizards like iguanas have teeth as well. So, uh, okay. so all right, yeah. everyone wave bye to Douglas. <laughs> Douglas is waving to us. Awesome. Okay, we're going to do another poll. So here's a close up look at Douglas. And you can kind of see that nostril or the nair that Kyle was pointing out. They use for smelling all around. And they're Definitely their scales look like shingles. Okay, here we go with your poll. Launching it for you. How do reptiles avoid predators? There are many different ways. Do they camouflage or blend in with their habitat? Do they drop a tail? Do they puff themselves up, make themselves big? Or have tails that rattle? or do they have bright colors? You can pick one or all, what, however many you would like. Turn and tell your neighbor, give you a second to put it in the poll. You're doing great. We've got a lot of answers coming in and you're all basically answering everything. So that's perfect. There are most, animals, reptiles will be camouflaged and blend in, but some will have bright colors. So they stand out and say, I am venomous or I might be. So maybe don't uh, come near me. They might drop a tail like a lizard or most will make themselves big, try and be a little bit scarier, just like we might do if we see a bear or something. Um, and then some of them do have tails that rattle. So good job. Looks like your answers are mostly in. So I'll share the results with you. There they are. Okay, now we are ready for our final animal. Let's guess who it is. You can pop it in the chat. I have four legs and a tail. So just like our last animal. Sometimes I live 150 years or more, yeah, some of these species. I am not super fast. Don't show yet though. <laughs> and I have bones that grow on the outside for protection. So let's look at the chat. What do we think it is? 
Good. Oh, someone even guessed armadillo. That's not a reptile though. Good, you're all getting it. It is a turtle. Good job, everybody. We're gonna look at this one up close. So let me turn and stop sharing. Come on up, show us our turtle. All right, look like a lot of people got that right. Did you guys see the turtle sneak in there? I think some of you might've cheated a little bit. That's okay. All right, so this is one of our painted river terrapins. Uh, these are probably my favorite turtle that we have here at the zoo. Uh, these guys are from, um, they're found throughout, in, so not this, this particular species is found throughout Southeast Asia, uh, like Malaysia, uh, I believe they range into Thailand, um, Badiger in general, which is a critically endangered genus of turtles. Uh, they're found throughout Southeast Asia and India. Um, again, very cool turtles. Uh, they're aquatic. So you can see Douglas has these webbed feet. And oh, this isn't Douglas. Sorry, the skink is Douglas. That's right. Shelly. Yeah, yeah, this is Shelly. Sorry. Shelly. Sorry, I still got Douglas on my mind. Yeah. Um, so Shelly, and Shelly is a boy, but um, Shelly has these webbed feet which help him move through the water. And um, oh, right. Shelly's cloud. <laughs> all over my chair. Douglas sets a bad example for everybody. Now he has the other animals doing this too. Terrible. Um, so yeah, so they move through the water really well. Uh, they're a freshwater turtle, so they're not found in the ocean like uh, like sea turtles. So they can be found in brackish water, which uh, the easiest way to explain that would be uh, water with low salinity, but nothing close to the, uh, to the ocean. So they're found in salt and brackish water. Uh, these guys are herbivores. Um, not a lot is actually known about their wild diet. Uh, with the with the um, painted river terrapins, but here they do seem to love leafy green vegetables and fruit. And there's also a uh, a turtle pellet that we feed most of our turtles and tortoises here, and they love that as well. So um, yeah, these guys aren't going to eat um, earthworms or aquatic invertebrates like snails or uh, or um, or even aquatic vertebrates like fish. They don't tend to go after those like a lot of other aquatic turtles will. Uh, they tend to be primarily or 100% herbivorous. Um, so yeah, these guys. Are, as, yeah, yes, yeah, moving close. So as I said, these guys are critically endangered. So uh, we're really happy to work with them here at the zoo. Uh, we have two males here. So Shelly, uh, Shelly has a, another male friend on exhibit there, and we have two females. So we're hoping to be able to breed them in the near future to uh, help sustain the population, uh, at least in zoos which can serve as assurance populations that their numbers continue to go down in the wild due to uh, overcollecting for the pet trade, habitat loss, and uh, overfishing, which uh, also affects their, their wild habitat. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of the main things about this species. Um, what makes turtles remarkable? Uh, so very cool thing. and. Sorry, I'm thinking about Valentine's Day, so I'm on this romantic kick here. Uh, so one thing that makes Douglas remarkable, I keep calling him Douglas. Shelly. Shelly, <laughs> Shelly not Douglas. It would be a good name um, for him. Yeah, he, he acts like Douglas, so. Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, one thing that makes Shelly remarkable, if you look at the colors Shelly is displaying here, uh, so if you want to bend the head down a little bit, Adam. So Shelly looks like a watermelon right now. So it's hard to see. Let yep. me share the screen and I'll show the picture. Yep. That'll be easier right, to there see. We go. So Shelly looks like a watermelon right now, and they only display these colors during part of the year. So these are their breeding season colors, which means that Shelly's trying to look really good to uh, attract the attention of the female turtles that he's housed with. So uh, Shelly's working hard um, to help to uh, do his job to uh, get, um, let's attract. see, what's the best to explain this, to attract the females, there we go, uh, in hopes of uh, them laying eggs in the future. So, uh, so yeah, you only see this during part of the year. So outside of the breeding season, these guys get really dark. Uh, that head color is a lot muted. You don't see that bright stripe. So if any of you guys are on site at the zoo, um, now is a great time, or in the area, now is a great time to come on site to the zoo because you can see these bright colors on our male painted river terrapins. You know, I would say they look like a watermelon. So that's what's really cool about these guys that uh, I believe makes them remarkable is uh, that how they have that very distinct pattern that's only displayed during part of the year. Um, how so yeah. heavy is him? Adam looks like he's struggling yeah. a little. Oh, and I forgot to introduce Adam here. Adam's another yeah. one of our keepers. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, Adam has just recently come on and he's our primary uh, turtle guy at the moment. So uh, Adam takes care of a lot of the big tortoises and our snake neck turtles. So uh, yeah, we're happy to have him on board. But um, but yeah, so Doug, I'm- Shelly. Don't let me do that. <laughs> Shelly weighs about 
25 pounds, I'd say. Um, and the, uh, these guys are actually what we call sexually dimorphic. So the females get way bigger than the males. Our females are almost 50 pounds now. Uh, I can barely lift them anymore. Um, so yeah, so yeah, they're a very good sized turtle. Uh, they're one of the biggest that we have in our collection. That's awesome. Yep. All right, we can do questions, Erica, and you can put Shelly away if you okay. need to. Okay. <laughs> Shelly's heavy. Well, it's great to see Shelly. Well, that shell is awesome. And somebody wants to know if turtles are born with their shell. And I think this is something pretty remarkable about turtles. Yes, yeah, so that shell is attached to them. That's a part of their body that's bone. Uh, they are born with their shell. Um, it's not like a uh, like a hermit crab where they're kind of, as they're growing, they're going, changing shells and things and looking for a new shell. That's a, a part of their body and it grows with them. So yeah, they have that shell coming straight out the egg. That's turtles and tortoises. Great. And for their shells also, why do some turtles hide in their shells and can all turtles hide in their shells? Uh, yeah, so that's an adaptation. Uh, their shells are very thick and hard and that protects them from predators. So, um, so yes, yeah, some turtles can retreat completely into their shells. Uh, like a uh, good example of that would be our or Beretti, one of our Asian box turtles here, that animal can close completely into its shell. Uh, the U.S. box turtles can do the same thing. Uh, Shelly can't completely uh, enclose himself into his shell, but he can turn his head sideways and pull his feet in. So he'd still be pretty well protected in the shell while not being completely enclosed. And that's the case with most of the aquatic turtles is they can't completely enclose themselves into their shell, but uh, their feet and head will fold away to where nothing's too exposed. We had some people notice a really unique nostrils of Shelly. Um, why is her nose like that? And do turtles breathe underwater? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So um, turtles can, uh, they can actually um, pull in air through what's called the uh, cloaca. So we call that cloacal respiration. Um, these guys will come up for air. So they will breathe through their nares. But um, yeah, a lot of aquatic turtles have the ability to um, to do to do both things. So they don't have gills like a fish, but um, they can stay underwater for very long periods of time without having to come up for air. Great, thank you. And um, somebody is asking, uh, wasn't the terrapin a tortoise? Can you tell us the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the short answer to that is turtles are typically found in or near water. Um, they rely on a much more, uh, a much less dry environment. Um, their feet are a lot different. Turtles are going to have the web feet, whereas uh, tortoises have what we call elephantine feet. Um, so if you think of their feet, they look a lot more like an elephant's foot, uh, whereas turtles are going to have, have those web feet. Um, so that's the main difference is the habitat they're found in. Uh, the shells on tortoises are a lot different. Uh, it's a little hard to explain without putting them next to each other to point some of those things out. But uh, the, um, the doming and features on tortoise shells are a lot different than turtle shells. Turtle shells tend to be a lot more smooth, um, even with the terrestrial turtles. So that's kind of the short, short answer to that. Thank you. And we've talked a lot about pets so far and that some reptiles can make good pets, but you talked about this one being a critically endangered species. Would that be one that people should have as a pet? Uh, no. So... Turtles in general tend to make very difficult pets. Uh, they're very high maintenance. Um, they make a lot of mess. They eat a lot. They poop a lot. Uh, they have very tricky um, UV light requirements to uh, make sure their shells stay nice and pretty. Uh, so I don't usually recommend turtles as pets until you've got a lot of experience under your belt with reptiles and uh, really have learned a lot and know what you're getting into. Um, although, um, Turtles like Shelly can be found in the pet trade. Um, people that do well with them tend to have very large like outdoor ponds in Florida, pretty much. Uh, so yeah, so they are bred in captivity by both zoos and private hobbyists. Um, and again, nobody's pulling these animals from the wild anymore. Um, they are protected due to being critically endangered. But uh, yeah, so you wouldn't want to keep one of those as a pet just due to their sheer size alone and the uh, the volume of water they would need, like unless you're trying to dedicate a whole section of your living room or basement to uh to your turtle uh yeah you don't want to keep uh keep a big aquatic turtle as a pet that'd be very difficult 
Great, thank you. And I'm seeing so many reactions coming through, just hearts and clapping. I think we've got some reptile lovers out there and you've talked a little bit about what we can do um, to protect them. So we've got critically endangered reptiles and a lot of reptiles living around us. What are some of the ways that we can protect them? Um, so, I mean, the biggest thing affecting reptile populations is habitat loss. Uh, now that's a heavy burden for, uh, you know, I know a lot of you guys are still in elementary school. They're watching this. So, um, you, know, you guys can't necessarily go, uh, donate a bunch of money to, pr you know, protect their habitat or, uh, make sure parts of their habitat can be no longer accessible for development and things like that. But uh, all the little things you do every day from, um, from recycling to, uh, you know, being uh, conscious about your water use, all those little kinds of things, those help to protect wildlife in general, and those things directly impact reptiles. Great, thank you. Well, I think we could probably ask you questions all day long, but I don't think we have enough time for all of them. So, Caden, I think we'll turn it back over to you both. Sounds good. Bye, Kyle. Everyone wave bye. 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 Give him a heart. And I apologize for Douglas. He... <laughs> You know, it's hard to train reptiles, but in the career video with Kyle, you can see that reptiles are trainable, maybe not potty trainable, uh, but you can see some of the ways that he does train them. So thank you so much, Kyle and Adam for helping. Okay, so there, final picture of our turtle, Shelly. Now, if you see a turtle crossing the road, what should you do? This will be a chat question. What do you think? Should you leave it alone or help it cross? Hmm. I see both coming in. Good, a little bit more helping it cross. This is a hard one, actually. So I'm not putting a correct answer down because it really depends on the situation. So if you see a turtle wanting to cross the road, what should you do? Ask an adult to help. Help them make the decision. Make sure that you've told them, hey, I've seen this program and I have some ideas, um, but there are some different ways you can do it. If it is safe for you to pull over and help the turtle cross the road, do so. You can pull over and at least block traffic or if it's not a busy road, stop your car, but this is all an adult should be helping you do this. If you do help a turtle cross the road, just pick it up by its shell, not its tail, its leg, its head, and the snapping turtle over here. They have long necks, so make sure you're grabbing them by the back of the shell towards the tail so that they don't get you. You want to make sure you uh, put them on the side of the road where they are traveling to. So if they are walking across, don't pick them up and put them back on this side just because it's the closest side. They're going to want to keep going. They want to go there for a reason. It might be habitat or food uh, or shelter that they want to get to. Uh, so put them in the direction of their travel, and then they probably won't go back across the road uh, anytime soon. But make sure you ask an adult to help, and there should be a link in the chat that can give you more information um, on helping turtles. All right, so we talked to Kyle a little bit at the end about what we can do. So what will you do to help reptiles? Will you help keep their habitats clean? So picking up litter, recycling, Will you help admire them from a distance so you don't stress them out and get too close? Learn more about reptiles in your area so you know what's around you. Share your love of reptiles. Tell them how cool this program was, how cool the reptiles you see outside are, or even create a conservation comic. And I'm gonna show you what that is at the end. Here's mine. But remember, we showed it at the beginning, if you saw it, a little comic showing your love of animals and how we can help protect them. Good, I see a lot of answers coming in, that's great. A lot of keep the habitats clean, but everyone's answering a little of everything, that is perfect. Clean habitats are healthy habitats and that's what all of the animals need. So that won't only help reptiles, it'll help all animals around, so that is great. Awesome, good job everybody. All right, so if you wanna share your drawings, remember we've got the worksheet you can finish, feel free to send us a picture of that if you want, or the conservation comic. Here is my conservation comic so you can kind of see what it looks like, but I would love to see yours. So email them and I would love to see them and I'll send you a thank you afterwards. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kyle and Adam again, and everyone have a great day and go check out some reptiles outside. Might have to wait till spring or summer when it warms up. Have a great week, everybody.